Mr. Lackey, your closing. Thank you. Good morning, folks. Um, at the opening, I asked you guys to keep your, your eyes and your ears open. But uh, to always remember as you're listening to the evidence that the state, in this case, has the burden of proof. And they have that burden of, burden of proof to prove Gerald guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. That burden never shifts. You have been read the final jury instructions, and I'm not going to completely belabor the point, but under the burden of proof instruction that you will have and you will see, it, it talks about what reasonable doubt is. Um, also, there's a reference to reasonable doubt in the alibi instruction. And this one is shorter, and again, you guys will have this and can go over it in detail. But the state here has the burden of proving, again, beyond a reasonable doubt, that the defendant, Gerald Bowman, was present at the time and place of the alleged, the alleged crime was committed. If you have a reasonable doubt whether Gerald was present at the time and place the alleged crime was committed, you must find him not guilty. So, And again, reasonable doubt is if, if there's a real possibility that he wasn't there, you got to find him not guilty. Now, let's look at the areas of abundant reasonable doubt in this case. Understand that before this trial began, where we all were gathered here, there was only one person out of 37 that was able to say that claim that Gerald was there. That's Sharika Sharad. 37 witnesses interviewed, four lineups, including Eric Hood's, one ID. We had seven witnesses at trial. Two, only two said he claimed he was there. Sharika Sharad, Eric Hood. That's it. No one, again, no one before this trial began identified Gerald as being there at that Arch Center other than Sharika Sharad. Now, Mr. Eckstein did an excellent job, both attorneys, uh, Mr. Ballinger too, did an excellent job of showing you guys Ms. Sharika Sharad's credibility and how that's all been brought into question. I'm not going to belabor that point. But even as it relates to just Gerald, you understand I represent Gerald, think about her testimony. January 28, 2015, Four days after uh, this, the, this incident occurred, all she could remember, what she told Detective Santos, what I remembered was hair and an army bandana. That's what stuck out to me. What did she say at trial? Oh, yeah, his uh, eyes and ears. So now all of a sudden, you know, we've got that. Think about her credibility in terms of the access to the photographs on Instagram. She shared those with Mr. Hood the night of the incident, even though Mr. Hood got up on the stand and claimed, oh, no, I, I never saw anything on Instagram. But for Gerald having the, the misfortune of taking a picture with his buddies, is he even here today? And this was that photograph of the Suns game that um, Ms. Sharika Sherrod saw, shared with Mr. Hood on the night of the incident. And so Gerald told you on the stand that his profile on Instagram was public. So that means that you know, they can go to this name, name down here or even go to him on Instagram, poke, you know, put the cursor on him or their thumb, see who it is, and then go to that profile. She identified Chris Melendez, the guy that initially ran up and hit Mr. Hood in the head outside the doors of the gym. She ID'd him from this photograph, although later she wasn't able to pick him out of the lineup. He didn't even have a, he didn't even have a bandana on, supposedly. Um, Rob, light-skinned guy, kind of short, doesn't fit the MO. Probably the luckiest guy here is Jalen Strong. I don't know, maybe he didn't have a profile, or maybe if they did click on it, they made some kind of judgment call about who has the best football program, USC versus ASU, uh, and, and picked USC. 
as much as that pains me to say that. But very easily, Jalen Strong could have been sitting over there rather than Gerald had this thing worked out a different way. Now, one of the things that Gerald talked about was people confusing him with Julius. Now, you're, you have pictures. You're going to have pictures of Julius Cain in evidence, and you'll be able to review those. And what I want you to pay particularly close attention to is their relative size to each other, their haircuts at the time, and also their skin tone. Okay, that's going to be important here later, and I'm going to talk about that uh, a little bit later. So, again, out of this photograph, Ms. Sherrod is able to identify Gerald from supposedly he was, he was at this scene. We know the sun was down. She sees Mr. Hood get socked right outside the gym doors, runs near a picnic table, which nobody else really verified or backed up. Again, in the middle of the night, returns, or not in the middle of the night, but when it's dark, she returns, she runs over to get some coaches, none of whom can ID Gerald as being there. And then she comes back. And again, inter interestingly, she makes an ID of a guy from this photograph, Chris, and she can't pick him out three months later out of a lineup. Remember, this guy did not have a bandana on. Think about the timing. She looked at that Instagram picture with Mr. Hood on the night of the offense. Two days later, she calls Detective Santos. Guess what, Detective Santos? I've ID all five guys that were there through two Instagram photos. Detective Santos is like, oh, that's great. Come on down. Puts together, he figures out who, you know, who she claims is there. It's a known photograph of Gerald. Again, at that point, four days later, puts that photograph in and puts it to her and say, you see the guy? Yeah, there he is. Well, how hard was that for her? It's obvious her ID of Gerald was unreliable. Think about the people who were there, that we know were there, that couldn't pick Gerald out of the lineup. A.D. Sanchez. Couldn't pick anyone out. Mustafa Halal, who actually came into court, testified truthfully and credibly, couldn't pick him out. <laughs> Lastly, Eric Hood. Which brings me to Eric Hood. What did Detective Santos tell you guys about recall? And you know what, put aside what he says. What does common sense tell you? If some event happens, when are you most likely to remember the details of that event? More toward when it was more recent, or like years later, days later even. And in this case, two and a half years, more than two and a half years later. Because again, before this trial, Mr. Hood could not pick Gerald out of this lineup, all right? But he was here, he was sitting in court during the opening, he heard me get up and tell you, folks, you're gonna hear from only one person that's gonna place Gerald there. What did he do? Got up on that stand, strolled up here, and goes, oh yeah, there he is, that's him. I could go out right now, pick, get any guy off the street, and, and have him come up here to the lobby and say, listen, we're on trial, there are two guys that play NBA basketball, and there's another guy. Go in there and see if you can pick him out. What's he gonna do? He's gonna come in here, look at these tables, see these tall guys here, and see me and Gerald in the back. Who you think, and who you think he's gonna pick out? Now, one of the things that was really curious about uh, one of Mr. Hood's comments during uh, this trial was he actually responded to someone and said, you know, it, it would just be easier to lie about all this stuff. No, that's not true. 
You know this again from common sense, from daily living. It's always easier to tell the truth than it is to lie. Think about his testimony about this lineup. What was his excuse for that? Oh, well, the only reason I couldn't pick him out was I told Detective Santos, this is a, man, this is a crappy lineup. I can't believe you're showing it to me. It's not what Detective Santos told us. I asked him, hey, did Mr. Hood have any problems with this lineup? No. Think about Mr. Hood's underlying motivation in all of this. And you know what it is, right? Again, Mr. Eckstein talked about it on, on Thursday. And Mr. Ballinger, I'm sure, is going to bring it home here after I get there. But think about it. Wouldn't this case be weaker for Mr. Hood versus the twins if all of a sudden people start disappearing from it at the last minute? If he comes in, tells the truth, and goes, yeah, I don't know, that, that, that ain't him. Isn't it more plausible that when Mr. Hood and, and Sharika Sherrod were looking through the twins in an Instagram photos, again, they saw Julius, saw Gerald, they saw Chris, they saw Rob, they saw Jalen, they saw the twins, and they start clicking through. They, they start clicking through to Gerald's profile. What do they see? USC. What do they read? Gerald trying to fulfill his NFL dreams, being out here and training. Then what do they see? Dollar signs. Folks, really, you know, I talked to you about those two areas of reasonable doubt. And believe me, that's plenty. That's a chocolate. But the heart of the matter, the real heart of this matter, is that Gerald wasn't there. How do we know that? First off, the video and the photographs of the people in the gym who Mr. Hood identified as, oh yeah, that's him, that's the guy. You guys are going to have the opportunity to look through that, to look through the videos and the photographs. And we're going to get to them. I'm going to, I'm going to point them out here for you here in a minute. So we'll return to that. But we also had at least four credible witnesses that told you Gerald wasn't there. You had Abby Howe, who came in. You had Josh Joe, who was the barber. You had Gerald himself. And through a jury, a, a jury question, we found out that uh, the people that were there, that Julius Kane said that Gerald wasn't there. Now, Abby Howe, think about her, the young lady that came here. Gerald and her boyfriend, Gerald her boyfriend, Jalen, and she were together that Saturday afternoon, January 24, 2015. What were they together for? They were going to the mall to get some clothes to go out that night. After shopping, all of them got back in the car, went back to that apartment on Cactus in the 101 that, they, that Gerald shared with Jalen and Rob, two, got two other guys that were trying to achieve their NFL dreams. She got there, she testified, she went in, tried on some clothes, came out, she said she's in the living room, she looked through in, in the kitchen area, sees Gerald getting his hair cut. And what happened later that night? They all went out. Now, she wasn't clear on times, you know, but she remembered, oh, yeah, I remember the, you know, about the day, it was getting kind of dark. And think about that timeline. We're gonna get into that a little bit more with Mr. Joe. But, she testified truthfully. She testified credibly. What kind of rub does she have? What is she going to get out of this? Josh Joe, Barber. He's the one that gave you that specific timeline. And that was based on this photograph of a kid, or of a guy, whose hair he cut January 24th, 2015. Six o'clock. Took a picture of it. He said he was just starting out, building up his portfolio, and thought that was a good haircut. And you know, I, I think it's right. It looks like a pretty nice haircut. So he leaves that haircut. He leaves this fellow. He said he was down around Southern and uh, 40th Street or 48th Street or 40th Street, and he drives up to the 101 Cactus. Okay. <clears throat> so. 
that's at least about 30, 45 minutes out. Or they get any, I believe he testified to that he got there around 6.45, 7 -ish. We know from the CAD report, the computer-aided display, and we got this through Detective Santos, that the first time anyone called this incident in was 9, or excuse me, 7.30 that night by Sharika Sharad. That's the first time, the first time that was called in. And she had driven down the street into the ways because she got lost going to the hospital. So that's kind of where our timeline is. So you can kind of work backwards from that and figure the actual incident happened between 7 and 7.30, maybe between 6.50 and 7.20, right? But roughly at that same time. So what was Gerald doing at that time? He was getting his hair cut by Josh Joe. <coughs> Now, <clears throat> for the state, they got up here and told you that, you know, oh, hey, detective, isn't it, isn't it true that, you know, Josh, Joe, and Gerald could have got her on fake textmessage.com and just fabricated everything? Well, yeah, and I guess if they both had wings, they could fly. Should have asked them that, too. And then they proffer this text message as being, you know, essentially wanting you to swallow this argument whole that this is fake. So, do you, do you believe that these two guys would get together and not only fake where they were and what they were doing, I mean, heck, they don't even, you know, it's not even a solid alibi at that time. I mean, it, it, it gives you a rough picture of where they were. Somebody were faking this, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be more time specific? Wouldn't it be like, hey man, yeah, it's 7.15, right? Or something like that. Then the other part of it is, are they also gonna fake another text message for February 9th? Are they, gonna, are they gonna be that sophisticated to fake that and go, hey man, we gotta make this look really good. So let's do a fake text message later. What's Josh Joe's motivation, folks? Why would he come in here and lie to you? What's he gonna get out of this? Okay, Gerald lives in LA. Josh Joe lives here in Phoenix. I mean, is Gerald gonna promise to fly him out here and have his hair cut every time? It, you know, is there's nothing in it for him. Like I said the most plausible explanation for Josh Joe's testimony is that it's the truth. Essentially, to believe the state, to believe their argument, you have to believe, essentially, that there's some type of conspiracy that existed between Gerald and Ab, Gerald and Josh Jones. But again, there isn't one. There never was one because there's no need for one. These folks were telling the truth. <laughs> Lastly, you, you heard from Gerald himself. He was up there on the stand. You could assess his credibility. You know, let's talk about this infamous bandana. So the state, again, puts a picture up of Gerald wearing a bandana in college. And if you remember, the question was, Gerald, are you in the habit of wearing a bandana? That's not camouflage, by the way. And he said, no. And then the state, in, in, in the closing, I thought it was interesting, Mr. Fisher got up here and says, well, you know, Ah, yeah, you can give it to Mr. Blackie. I, I, we can see that point that, um, that we can't prove that Gerald owns one, but look at this picture. So the fact that Gerald, and again, this is from the state's own mouth, they're telling you to dismiss Gerald's entire testimony based on the fact that he forgot about wearing a, wearing a bandana on vacation in Cabo this past July. I think about that. What makes sense? I, you know, I guess this is another question we could have asked uh, Detective Santos. Detective Santos, isn't it possible that Gerald got on an ATV in Los Angeles and drove it all the way down to Cabo with that bandana on his face? And you know, I guess the answer would be, yeah, I guess. But what's again? What makes sense? What makes what's logical? He went to Cabo. He rented an ATV. 
You can see from that picture, there was a helmet, gloves, and goggles. I mean, what happens if you decide to go down to Cabo on vacation? You're gonna bring all that stuff? You know, are you gonna go there to an ATV place and then the fellow running it says, you know, Senor, donde esta su bandana? Is that gonna happen? Or are they gonna say, here's a bandana, you want? And think about this for a minute. If this, if this bandana was so dang important to this investigation, if the Santos told you he knew where Gerald was, why didn't they do a search for him? Why didn't they go find it? Why isn't it in that exhibit box? But again, we, are, we don't really even need to go there because Gerald told you why he was here. He was here in town to try to achieve his dream of playing in the NFL. He was here training. Does he know the twins? Sure he does. They're friends. They've known each other since since they were kids. The twins invited him out to a son's game. He takes a break from training, goes out there, takes that infamous picture, and here he is. But he did. He told you where he was. He told you what he was doing, and he told you who he was with back on January 24th, 2015. And the man never saw Arch, even knew it existed, prior to seeing these pictures here in Trump. Finally, I want to get to I use some Spanish, I'll use some French. The Peach Day resistance of the state's case versus Gerald. You can dim the lights a little bit. Yeah. And again, you guys are gonna have this, you guys are gonna have these pictures back there. And we would ask that you really, really look at these closely. It just, you know, you, this is great for, you know, what we have right now. But again, you guys would be actually able to look at these very closely uh, in the jury room. But remember, that's supposed to be Gerald. Look at the head. Look at the, look at the, um, what looked like braids coming down this guy's head. You know, we would possibly say that probably looks more like Marshawn Lynch or some 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 other person like that with braids than it does Gerald. And remember, this is Julius. Again, you'll have these photos. You'll be able to look. And remember when I talked about skin tone, Julius and Gerald are about the same complexion. So. Look at, you can, you can see it a little bit, but again, you know, it's better when you actually have these physical photos in front of you. You can see that complexion. You can see the lightness in Gerald. And then you contrast it with this guy, who is obviously darker. And again, you know, keep in mind that this is the photo, you know, this is the same photo that Mr. Fisher got up here at the, the very last one with a big old guilty across it. This is it. This, according to them, is Gerald. That guy in this picture, which looks like something jutting off, off behind his head, who knows what that is. But again, look at the complexion. Look at the complexion of Julius, who's sitting next to whoever this fellow is. And then look at the twins. And then look at Chris Melendez there in the middle of them. And then look at their complexions relative to each other. Again, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Look at it. It's not Gerald. You know, and, and honestly, folks, this case would almost be laughable if it wasn't so serious. And this is serious. We're here. This is Maricopa County Superior Court. My client's facing two counts of aggravated assault. Gerald got up here and honestly told you what he was doing and how the, just the pendency of this case, how it's affected him. And that's time he can't get back. January through February of 2015, he was out here busting his hump for his shot at the NFL. Again, you heard him, you saw him. You can assess them. 
Now think about that. Is he going to throw all of that away to go to some place he's never been, to jump in and help beat up some guy that may or may not have some kind of beef with the twins or a beef with Julius Cain? It doesn't make any sense. We would echo what Mr. Eckstein told you in his closing. I, I, we would echo that with regard to you folks, the jury. You're the last stop. You're the last ones that can make this right. We ask you to do, in this case, what the evidence, and really from the state's point, their lack of evidence, compels you to do. And that's fine, Gerald, not guilty. Thank you. Thank you.